As we're singing about, I'll build my, um, you know, what we're saying, I'll I, I, we'll build our lives on the firm foundation, and that is him. You know, I was just really stirred about some things I'm going to be sharing with you today. I feel it's very connected to what's going on in our society today, uh, because all other things are sinking and just shifting constantly. Culture is shifting. You know, what's fashionable today is not fashionable in a couple of years' time or five years' time. And, and we cannot be a people that are constantly changing in terms of uh, our belief systems and our perspectives in terms of um, how God has, who God has called us to be, we cannot be changing our identity based on the fact that the world is not found its own true identity and constantly just shifting and changing. I mean, what's fashionable in our culture right now, 2017, um, was unacceptable in 1960. Okay, so if we base our life based on what's acceptable each time, then we're constantly just changing. Okay, well, this is not acceptable anymore in our culture, so we're going to just conform to what people say is okay for us to do. So what we end up being as believers is we end up conforming to what they say we should be like as opposed to what he says we should be like. Because if we go with what he says we should be like, it's not going to line up with what they say we should be like. So we have to be listening to what he's telling us about who we are as opposed to what society is telling us about who we should be. Are you listening to me today? Yes. One of the fundamental problems we have as believers is identity. Identity issues. We, we take our identity from so many other things apart from who God has called us to be. But not too long ago, I felt the Lord just challenged me to turn off the news for a season because I found myself just constantly going to listen to what was happening in the world and what's happening here and what's happening there and what this person is saying and what that person is saying. And I felt like God was saying to me, you're so caught up in the news activity of the earth realm, you're disconnected from the news of heaven. Your mind is so clogged up with the ideas of man, when I speak, you're looking at it through the lens of the opinions of what you've already heard. So you're looking at the TV and letting them inform your own opinions and give you the right perspective. And we don't really realize a lot of what we watch and what we always see has a lot of hidden agendas behind it. You can't just take everything and just swallow it because it's there on the news or it's there because you saw someone say it on TV and we have to be so conscious of what we're listening to what we're allowing to come into our system what is informing us of who we are and who we're called to be because I'm telling you the world we're living in you know it the darkness is increasing but I love the word of God when it says the glory of God is also going to increase in Isaiah as the darkness increases guess what the glory is also going to increase However, we need to be aware that the darkness is increasing. We're not afraid of the darkness. However, we need to be strong in the light. Everyone say, strong in the light. How many of you know Jesus was able to hang out with unbelievers? People that didn't believe in him. Jesus was able to go to parties and hang out with people who were living sinful lifestyles. But when he stepped into their culture, he shifted the atmosphere. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. When you step into a culture, if what you're carrying is not as strong as what is ruling in that culture, you come under that culture and are influenced by that culture and your behavioral patterns align with that culture. When Jesus stepped into the culture of the world, he was strong in the light. So when he stepped into their darkness, he invaded it. He he infected it. He impacted it. So many believers have a lot of, um, I mean, we all would have unbelievers, people who don't believe in Jesus. We have friends who, you know, live lifestyles that are not in alignment with what we believe God says in the, in the Bible. We, we see all these things around us. And the Bible says we're in the world, not of the world, right? Right? Anyone alive today? The Bible says we're in the world, but not of the world. The people of God who become of the world while in the world lose the authority to change the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. The world has its culture and its system, but we're not subscribing to that system and that culture. We're subscribing to a heavenly culture and heavenly system. But this is the problem. 
When you step into the ungodly culture and the ungodly systems around us, and you go to your schools, universities, your neighborhood, and you're there as a believer, and you're hanging around people that don't believe what you believe, and people who live lifestyles of addictions and all kinds of darkness, when you step into their culture, listen, if they are stronger in the darkness than you are in the light, they influence the atmosphere in that place. Whoever is stronger on whatever side influences the atmosphere and the culture. And many of the times we believers are hanging around situations where we are not doing the influencing, we are being influenced. So, Leon Revenue, he says, are you dead to the world or are you fascinated by it? Are we dying to the things of the world? We're, we're crucified to the desires, the things of the world. Or are we being fascinated? Are we being attracted to the things we're supposed to be disconnected from? So I want to call you today to a standard that I believe God is calling the church to in the UK. It may get intense in a few moments. Just so you know, I love you. <laughs> I'm not mad at you. <laughs> I, I like to say to people, you know, I, I'm just going to do me. So I'm going to just communicate the way I am. And you've got to see that I'm just being me. So I say, you do you and I'm going to do me. Okay. Okay. So uh, I want you to receive some of the things I'm about to share with you because um, I really do believe God's speaking that to us right now in the church. Um, I'm going to refer quickly to a passage of scripture. In Matthew um, 17, verse 9, uh, um, and I'm just going to scan through it very quickly. Um, Jesus has just had an experience with the disciples, a, a few of the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus has just been transfigured uh, before their eyes. Elijah, how many of you know Elijah did not die? Now, that's kind of incredible. I say to people, you can't say you're a believer in Christ and understand that and hold that book, that Bible, and say you believe that Bible and not believe in supernatural crazy things. <laughs> because, I mean, it's, it's crazy to even say that to people out there in the world. Elijah did not die. He was taken up into heaven by a chariot of fire. How about that? <laughs> That's not some fairy tale story. That actually happened. It actually happened. <laughs> Just think about that. So Elijah shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. Moses also shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And they're having some conversations. And then we come in uh, Matthew 17, verse 10. And the disciple asked Jesus, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming. And will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah has already come. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also going to suffer at their hands. Verse 13. Then the disciples understood that Jesus spoke to them of John the Baptist. Verse 11 says this. Jesus, so the disciples asked the question. They said, uh, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Because they just had an experience where they saw Elijah. They're a bit confused about what's going on here. They said, Jesus, you know, I thought the scribes teach that Elijah must come first. Jesus affirms the teachings of the scribes and says, yes, they're right. Elijah must come first. And then Jesus says this. Indeed, Elijah is coming. Everyone say, Elijah is coming. By Jesus releasing that declaration, he is confirming that the, the, the prophetic word spoken about in Malachi, which the scribes were teaching on, is not yet being fulfilled in its fullness. Are you with me? I need to track with me because I'm going somewhere with this. Jesus is saying, Elijah has come, and yes, you just saw Elijah on the mountaintop, but Jesus is then saying, yes, Elijah is coming. Everyone say, Elijah is, coming. Elijah is coming. That's a prophetic word. Jesus just said it. But then Elijah, Jesus also says, but Elijah has come. And they did not perceive it. 
And they then worked out, he was referring to John the Baptist. In Luke 1, the angel appeared to Zechariah and said to him that the son he was going to have was going to carry the spirit of Elijah. So we know that John the Baptist carried the spirit of Elijah on him. Now, John the Baptist, his job was to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus. So John, with a life of fasting and prayer, living in the desert, being a crazy guy, eating locusts and wild honey, doing all this radical stuff. By doing that, he was preparing the way for the manifestation of Jesus, the first coming of Jesus. Now, John carried the spirit of Elijah. So Jesus acknowledges that in the scripture. But Jesus also says, Elijah is coming again. The point I'm trying to get to is this. Just like the spirit of Elijah rested upon John to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus, how many of you believe Jesus is coming again? If you believe Jesus is coming again, release a shout right now. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm in the right place. <laughs> Jesus is coming again. There was a first coming. We read about that in the New Testament. Jesus' experience in healing people, doing all this, raising the dead, him being crucified, him being raised from the dead, and him ascending to heaven in Acts, you know. And he said, just the angels that saw the disciples in Acts, he says, just as this Jesus you saw go up, he's going to come down just like that. He's coming again. I'm telling you, we are not ready for this. The world is not ready for this. The church is not ready for the return of Jesus. However, just like the first coming of Jesus, there had to be preparations for it for the second coming of Jesus there's gonna be preparations for it the preparation for the first coming of Jesus in terms of his manifestation to the world that baptism time when John baptized the, the preparation to that point was based on John's lifestyle of radical devotion of fasting and prayer that was primarily the, the, the preparation for the first coming. D John was a Nazarite. He set himself apart to see God. He was consecrated to God. In the same way, just as the spirit of Elijah rested on John to prepare the way for the first coming, the spirit of Elijah is going to rest upon a generation to prepare the way for the second coming. Are you tracking with me? Elijah, uh, sorry, John had to be intense. Yes, Elijah was intense. John had to be intense in prayer, intense in fasting, intense in seeking God. He was preparing the way for what something, he was preparing the way for what God was about to do. And God is calling our generation to be intense like John was intense. We can't let the, the radical Islamic people be the radical people. They are radically believing in hate. How about radically believing in love to the point of we believe what we preach and teach enough to die for it? They're dying for what they believe in. How about we believe what we preach and teach about God, his love, and the fact that he cares for the world enough to die for it? If we believe enough to die for it, then we're going to live for it. And many believers are not living for it because I don't think they believe in enough to die for it. Something needs to shift in here of our belief system of who God has called us to be. And God has called us to be a generation that will prepare the way for his second coming. And that's going to look similar. No, I mean, we're not, not necessarily going to be walking around with camel hair and eating locusts and wild honey. I mean, if you want to do that, go ahead. Feel free. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> We're going we're gonna to live a life of radical devotion. That, that whole thing is a picture of radical devotion. Saying, God, how far do you want me to go? How abandoned do you want me to be? God wants to raise up radical followers. Radical in love. You know, radical does not need to become a negative word. It's a good word as far as God is concerned. Look at all the people that did anything significant for God. They were not normal. Read through history. John Wesley was not normal. Charles Finney was not normal. William Booth was not normal. Evan Roberts was not. These were people who were extreme in their passion for God. So how can you expect to do anything for God of lasting impact by being lukewarm, disconnected, and just coming to church and allowing, waiting for people to almost stir you up to get you excited? Are you with me? God is calling us to radical 
passion in love with him. Now, part of the reason why I need to lay this foundation is the spirit of Elijah rested on John and he prepared the way for the first coming. The spirit of Elijah is going to rest and is resting on us to prepare the way for the second coming. I love this quote by Francis Frangipane. Let it be known that if Elijah is coming before Jesus returns, so is Jezebel. Did you hear what I just said? <laughs> if Elijah is coming before Jesus returns, so is the spirit of Jezebel. Wherever you see the spirit of Elijah in the prophetic movement, Jezebel always manifests herself. And by the way, Jezebel is not just a woman, it's a spirit. And more than ever, the spirit of Jezebel is rampant in our culture, in our society. And I want to show you some of the manifestations of the spirit of Jezebel and how it's paralyzing and neutralizing the effectiveness of the church in the day we're living in. In Revelations 2.18, Revelations 2.18 these things says the Son of God, whose eyes are like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. He's saying to the church, I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience, your works. The last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow. Everyone say you allow. Okay, note that. You allow that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and each thing sacrificed to idols. Now, this is a, what I'm about to read may shock many of you because this is a side of Jesus we don't hear talked about on Sunday mornings. Jesus said, I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, listen to the words of Jesus in red letters. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed. What? Jesus is going to make her sick? Yes. It gets more intense. And those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of their deeds. Now, this bit shocks me. What I'm about to read. Jesus says, I will kill her children. I didn't say that. It's right there in your Bible. I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds. And I will give to each one according to his works. How many think that's a bit intense? <laughs> Jesus feels very passionate about dealing with this spirit. To the point of saying he will kill her children and he will cast her into the sick bed. Jesus feels very angry at the spirit that's causing the people of God to step into sexual immoralities. Jesus feels passionate about this. We read about Jesus in the Bible, and many times we talk about Jesus from the point of view of, oh, Jesus, my friend, is nice and lovely, and he's just cozy, and he won't say anything to hurt anyone. No, no, no. Jesus is a fiery man. His eyes burn with fire. It's both love for you, fiery passion for us, but fiery passion against anything that hinders love. He's mad at injustice. He's mad at all the junk that's been thrown at our generation and causing them to be bound. Jesus feels very passionate about these things. You think Jesus is not bothered by the fact that children are being abused right now? You think Jesus is not bothered by the fact that pornography is everywhere in our society and children are finding it by accident on the internet and getting hooked? You think Jesus doesn't care about that? He's really angry at that. To the point of saying, I'm going to kill somebody. When was the last time you heard that? <laughs> that Jesus is so upset about a situation, he's going to kill people who are participating and people, he's going to put them in a sick bed who are causing it. Sexual immorality is a huge deal in the heart of God. And according to this scripture, 
one of the workings of the spirit of Jezebel is an unleashing of sexual perversion upon a generation. More than ever, we are living in a time, in a system where everything is hyper-sexualized. You can't drive from here to the airport without seeing things that are sexualized. Why do you think there's a constant increase of the sexing up of everything around us? Because that spirit is at work and it wants to bind us, neutralize us, because it knows that God hates immorality. And the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The battle has never been between God and the devil. God has no opposites. However, the battle is God through us, human beings, against the devil. <laughs> And the enemy can't get to God. But he can hurt God by hurting the people that God loves. Because God is upset about the injustice and the perversion in our society. And many of us have become desensitized to the intensity of what's going on around us. If we compare society right now to this time 10 years ago, it's a lot more intense right now in terms of the sex and the filth and all the stuff. And if we compare society right now to what it was 50 years ago, it's almost unrecognizable. The illustration of you pour a frog in hot, in hot water, it jumps out. I've never tried this, by the way, but I'm told this is what happens. You pour a frog in hot water, it jumps out because it doesn't want to stay in hot water. If you pour a frog in warm water and gradually turn up the heat, apparently it doesn't detect the change in temperature. And obviously, eventually dies. The frog doesn't detect the change in temperature, but the temperature is changing. The fact that the frog does not detect it does not mean it's not changing. The fact that you are in your Christian bubble, maybe, the fact that you're going to school, high school, the fact that you're watching the news, you're seeing all these things, they are making abnormal things become so acceptable and normal to the system and the culture. And all the things we see on the TV, all the things we see in the movies, it's trying to indoctrinate a generation into a way of accepting abnormal as normal. And you, as a believer, have to be sensitive to what you allow into your eye gate, your ear gate, what you're listening to, what you're watching, the kind of movies you watch, the kind of music you buy. Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of stuff behind these things to desensitize us. I'm telling you, you can't just listen to any music. Okay, I'm going to touch on this. Do you think the Holy Spirit will sit with you in your house and listen to that music full of all the filth and be comfortable? All the immorality? All... Look, look at the music videos. It's like a porn movie. These days. Most of the popular pop culture music videos. I mean, is it just me? Does anyone see what I'm talking about? Am I on my own here? You can't just listen to, oh, yes, nice music, nice. Oh, I'm just listening to the beat. I just, I just like it. But there's a spirit behind you. You're entertaining. Lost. And it, it, its aim is to sublimate, like that frog, sublimate, you know the word. <laughs> Lay hold of our emotions, our hearts. So the things that are actually abnormal, you start to feel like they're okay now. We start to accept these things. I'm telling you, the enemy has been at this longer than we have been alive. The enemy is not stupid. Um, not too long ago, I had a dream. And in this dream, um, it was one of those dreams where I was in two states. I was in my body, but I was also out of my body. I could observe the room but I was also myself, a world of myself. I was given this space, this room, 
I don't know, maybe the size of this stage, something like that. Anyway, I walked in this room. There's some people there just doing their thing. And uh, there was this wall behind me. And this wall was covered up by this kind of bed sheet. It was covered up by some cloth of some sort. Anyway, I could see that there was a lot of stuff behind that cloth. In the dream, it was like the cloth wasn't there anymore. And I could see everything that was behind this wall. And all I could describe here is like all these ornaments, all these idols. You know when you go out to some of these restaurants, some of these Buddha things, all, the, the wall was just filled with all these like gods and idols and, and all that stuff. It was just there. My back is to the wall. However, there is a particular thing on the wall that grabs my attention more than everything else. And I later realized it's what we know as the head of Medusa. So if you know, it's Greek mythology. Medusa is this woman face thin, and the hair is all snakes, okay? So it's right there on the wall. And in my dream, this head is, it's not just on the wall, it's alive. It's got, it's got personality. I could feel the intensity of what's coming out from this thing. It was just intense. In the dream, I felt like I needed to cut that head off. Okay, so I am thinking to myself in the dream, one, I didn't have a sword, which is a bad sign. <laughs> but I, I, I wanted to cut the head off this thing. I'm thinking, I don't have a sword in my hand. I need to somehow try to pull this head off the wall. In the dream, I, I don't know how, because I didn't really know this consciously, but in the dream, I knew that I was not meant to look at the head of Medusa. So I was moving backwards and trying to somehow get my hands, I don't know how, get my hands to pull this head off this wall. I don't know why, I just knew this thing had to come down. Every time I tried to move back, the intensity of this spirit, I could feel its power on my shoulder. Like, I couldn't even move to get there. So I am struggling, thinking, how am I gonna do this? Very frustrated in the dream. I woke up just very frustrated <laughs> and, you know, their dreams and then their dreams. When I have certain dreams, I know God's speaking to me. And it wasn't one of those dreams where I was just going to mess about and just, oh yeah, that was just some random dream. I went into some intense time of prayer. And that day we had a conference. And in that conference, um, uh, we had uh, Jonathan Aloide from National Day of Prayer speaking. It was a prayer conference, prayer culture. And uh, I shared with him the dream and he gave me a bit of an interpretation of what he felt the dream meant. So during... Um, um, my session when I was teaching, he, I shared the dream and he came up and he said it, it felt like we needed to pray into that dream. And he said to me, he felt like that dream was a spirit. Uh, sorry, that, that, that head was a spirit that is affecting our generation that we needed to deal with. And my understanding from then was that this was a manifestation of the spirit of Jezebel. And my job was not to engage my eyes with it. Because the myth goes, all those who look at Medusa turn to stone. I was conscious in the dream I wasn't meant to look at this thing. So we led everyone in the conference into a time of repentance, dealing with sexual immorality, pornography, all kinds of sexual perversion, you know, confessing, saying, God, we need to, we need to deal with this thing in our lives. We will not tolerate sexual perversion. We will not tolerate all these addictions. Can I just, you know, time out, pull pause on that. The cross of Jesus is not about sin management. It's about sin eradication. Jesus can either set us free or we're just messing about, joking around and playing around in this room. The blood of Jesus is either strong enough to break every chain or this is a joke. I'm a living testimony. You probably hear some of my testimony later, depending on how we do for time. So we led this meeting in a time of repentance. You know, Lord, we're confessing the movies we've watched. We're confessing, you know, pornography addictions. We're confessing lust in our hearts and things. You know, leading everyone, men and women. Because pornography is not just a woman, sorry, a man thing. It's a woman thing too. It's like everywhere, okay? So we, we led in this confession. Anyway, after the conference, we went home. Go home. And we've got Apple TV. So it's 
I don't know how to describe it if you don't know what it is. If you know what it is, you know what it is. <laughs> so we turn it on, and right there on our screen, guess what is right there on our TV screen? The head of Medusa. However, this time, a guy is holding the head of Medusa like this. <laughs> He's looking away, holding the head of Medusa with his sword in his hand and the head already cut off. <laughs> now, when I've had a dream about that, and I've been praying about that thing to be cut off, and I turn on my TV, and I come and it's turned off on there. Do you think I see that as a coincidence? I see God is showing me in natural form. My dream was not just a dream. He's calling me to pick up my sword to cut the head of this thing. This spirit is coming down. Everyone say, it's coming down. We will not tolerate the spirit of immorality. No more. It comes down in me first. It comes down in you first. We're not going to start saying, oh, let's come down in the society. No, no, no. We're starting with us. Me and you. It's so intense in our culture right now that we have to we have to step up. And one of the things I've realized as a key to dealing with the draw of immorality and the pull around us is what Jesus reveals himself as to the church that's struggling with immorality. See, if you read the letters to the churches, Jesus reveals himself as, it reveals different aspects of his nature to different churches. To the church that's struggling with the spirit of Jezebel and immorality, do you know the first thing Jesus says to them? Look at this. These things says the Son of God, the Son of God, whose eyes are like a flame of fire. <laughs> he reveals himself to the church struggling in immorality as Jesus with the burning fiery eyes. Because one of the main weapons of immorality is to capture your gaze. So he's saying, don't be captured by that gaze. Have a revelation of my fiery eyes. God is calling you to have fire in your eyes, just like he has fire in his eyes. And when we behold the fire in his eyes, I believe that fire translates to our hearts. Listen to me and listen to me, Claire. I know what it is to be bound by pornography, so I'm not standing up here telling you I'm a superstar who's, you know, who has never looked at anything horrible and look at me, I'm so perfect and pure. No. Okay, I didn't mean to say this this early. My dad is somewhere here. <laughs> but the truth is, when I was struggling with pornography, you know, I went to my dad <laughs> and we prayed. <laughs> listen. The power of sin many times is in its secrecy. We have to get good at confessing. <laughs> I don't mean just go into your room and say, oh God, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. The Bible says, confess to one another that you may be healed. Something happens when you let it out and it's not just you. Jesus' eyes burning like fire. He wants our hearts and our eyes to burn like fire. Because the enemy is after our gaze. You know, 30% um, of the internet is porn. <laughs> I found this out yesterday. I was like, oh wow. Porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. Now, you, you also got to remember that the standard of Jesus is not committing, you know, we talk about law and grace, and people would say, oh, you know, we're, we're in the grace era, you know, we honor the gospel of grace. That is true, but we need to remember that even under the gospel of grace, the standard is a lot higher than under the law. Because the man of grace himself says this, when you think of lost in your heart, you've already done it. 
Okay, and many times the imaginations are informed by the things we see with our eyes. How many of you remember Samson? He was a man of power, anointed by God. When the enemy eventually got him bound, what did the enemy take out? His eyes. The enemy taking out his eyes in the natural was a picture of what had already happened in the spirit. Because Adam, not Adam, <laughs> Samson was already compromised in his lifestyle before he actually eventually fell and his hair was cut off. The enemy did not go after his power. The enemy went after his consecration, his purity. And because the intensity of the darkness is so much in our generation right now, the only way I have found to live pure in this generation, because you're living in the same generation I'm living in, you see everything around us just, just like I do. The only way I have found to keep my heart pure in this culture is to have a burning heart before God. It's not trying harder. <laughs> it's not trying to ignore this and that. Yeah, you, we need to stay away from certain things, obviously. But the only way I found to keep my heart pure before God is to keep my heart burning in the secret place. And my eyes captured by his gaze. See, there are no shortcuts to this. And the problem is many of us want an easy way out. We want to just, you know, someone to lay hands on us and boom, and things are sorted and everything, that's the end of it. And that does happen. And believe me, that's going to happen today because we're going to pray into not just this. There's some things I'll add to this in a moment. That happens. Deliverance comes. But when God releases freedom, the Bible says when a demon leaves a place, he goes away and then he comes back <laughs> to see what has happened. So if you get delivered... And you don't occupy your heart with a burning heart focused on God. When the enemy comes back to check you out and see what's going on, and you are still just messing around watching those things that, you know, are very borderline. And, you know, and you just, you're playing with fire. <laughs> you're kind of doing all this, just, you're, you're, you're blurring the lines. And the question is not, you know, how far can I go and get away with this? It's like, it's like, I just want to stay away from anything that offends and grieves you, Holy Spirit. It's not about, you know, how little can I do to get to heaven. It's how abandoned can I be on the earth and see heaven calm down. So when the enemy comes back and he sees that the person that has been delivered has not occupied their hearts with God and fill their hearts with the presence, the fire, prayer life, time in the word, and all these things, then he comes back with more demons. And the bondage of the person is greater the last time than it was the first time. It's not that you were never set free. The only way to keep your heart burning, and sorry, the only way to keep your heart pure in this generation is to embrace the burning heart just like John was burning in the desert. Just like the darkness is intense, we need to be intense in the light. We need to be intense in holiness. Did you hear me? Yes. Are you alive? Yes. The message of holiness may not draw a crowd, but that is the message that will build the end time army. The message may not be popular right now. Everyone is trying to preach about, you know, how to make you feel better, how to have a better life, and how to da-da-da-da. But God is wanting to raise up a pure and spotless bride. If you're going to clap, clap really loud. <laughs> you're not clapping for me. God is going to raise up a pure and spotless bride. And that's the truth. I'm going to round up... Um, with some things that I found very interesting as I was just thinking through this subject of sexual immorality. When Elijah shows up, Jezebel also shows up. And Jezebel wants to seduce the prophets. The spirit of Elijah comes on the scene, so does the spirit of Jezebel. God anoints 
Elijah to deal with the spirit in his generation. But Elijah did not finish the assignment. Elijah was, Elijah was actually intimidated by the spirit of Jezebel. Do you know the story? Elijah then came under a spirit of depression. That is one of the things, that's one of the, that's one of the things um, affecting, infecting, confronting, impacting our generation today. Depression, intimidation. Elijah came under that. Elijah then anoints a guy called Elisha. Elisha did not deal with Jezebel. Do you know who dealt with Jezebel? <laughs> a guy called Jehu. Everyone say Jehu. Jehu. Now, Jehu is on his way. So, Elisha has anointed Jehu in the secret place. Jehu comes out and he's on a mission to destroy Jezebel. In 2 Kings 9, uh, Eli uh, uh, Jehu is riding on his horse. And uh, 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 it says in 2 Kings 9.22, now it happened that Joram saw Jehu and he said, is it peace, Jehu? So Jehu answered, what peace? As long as the hollow trees of your mother Jezebel and her witchcraft are so many. Jezebel, witchcraft activity, very much connected. So Jehu is saying, there's definitely no peace because your mother Jezebel is the one that's infecting our culture and our system of all this craziness and I'm on a mission to destroy her. So Jehu is riding on his horse. Now look at what he says about Jehu. So the watchman reported saying he went up to them and is not coming back. So he's referring to one of the servants that they sent to Jehu who didn't come back because Jehu told that servant to follow him. <laughs> so he says, and Jehu is, the person is riding, is, is, is driving, is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. So that might not make a lot of sense to you. I'm just wanting to get to one point there. Jehu is riding on his horse to go and deal with Jezebel. A watchman on the wall is trying to discern what's going on and saying, who is that guy coming? And he's reporting that to another, I guess, to the king over here, saying, um, you know, there's a guy coming. I don't know who it is, but his riding is like Jehu. Because look at what it says. For he drives furiously. He rides his horse with violence. You know what that reminds me of? Matthew 11. The kingdom of heaven is suffering violence and the violence take it by force. The person and the people of God that would deal with the spirit of Jezebel have to be baptized with the Holy Spirit of violence. I mean the good violence. <laughs> There's bad violence and there's good violence. I'm not talking about physical violence. I'm talking about spiritual intensity violence. And Jehu captured that in the way he rode his horse. He was an intense individual. That's what I'm saying to you. You can't afford to be complacent. You can't afford to be lukewarm. You can't afford just to go to church on Sunday morning, go to Bible study, and think that's going to take you through. If all you do is go to church on Sunday morning, Bible study, and youth group conference, and that's all you do, you're going to backslide in the culture, and you're going to be influenced by the thing that you're supposed to influence. There is no other way. You have to be radical if you want to do this right there's no other way you have to be fast and furious you have to be intense now I'm running up Jehu gets to where Jezebel is and he's about to deal with Jezebel and you know what the Bible says oh my goodness this is awesome second Kings 9 30. Now Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard it, and when Jezebel heard that Jehu had come, she knew that her time was up. And she knew that Jehu had come to kill her. Do you know what she did in response to that? She put her makeup on. Read it. And she painted her, her face, her eyes, and adorned her head. And after she'd adorned her head and her face, she then looked through the window to see Jehu. Why did she do that? Because she wanted to engage his vision. The people who have an assignment to deal with the spirit of Jezebel cannot afford to be engaging with that spirit by their eyes and their eye gates. In my dream, I knew I could not look at that thing. 
Many believers have looked at it and now they've turned to stone, paralyzed. So she looked out of the window and says, J, and verse 31, 2 Kings 9, 31. Then as Jehu entered at the gates, she said, is it peace, Zimri, murderer of your master? Mocking him. Verse 32. And uh, Jehu looked up and he said this, who is on my side? So two or three eunuchs looked at him and then he said, throw her down. So they threw her down and some of her blood splattered on the wall and on the horses and she was trampled oh and he trampled her underfoot so Jezebel you know was was destroyed um, Jezebel looked out of the window to engage the sight of Jehu but Jehu was not seduced by her beauty because she carried a spirit of seduction. So she wanted to project that spirit over Jehu. Now he looked up, but he did not engage. You know, in the society we live in, you can't really get away from porn because sometimes you're not, it's like you're not looking for it, it's looking for you. <laughs> Movies, billboards, you can, you, you can see it around us. But I want to say to you, do not engage it. <laughs> Yeah. Because when you engage it, it has a hook in you. And you, if you give the enemy a foothold, he takes a stronghold. You can't afford to play with fire. This, I love this part I'm about to share with you. Who actually killed Jehu? I mean, sorry, who actually killed Jezebel? Jehu did not kill Jezebel. Do you know who killed Jezebel? The eunuchs. Do you know who the eunuchs are? <laughs> They're people whose reproductive organs have been cut off. These were the people that she had dominated, robbed of their sexual identity, and they were serving her, her agenda. Welcome to our generation. Sexual dysmorphia. Identity crisis. I mean, I looked on the internet the other day. Do you know how many genders there are? I'm thinking, the Bible says it made them male and female. Not male, female, and agender, and pangender, and all that jazz. I mean, does anybody believe the Bible today? Or am I going to get put in prison for saying this? More than ever, our generation is facing an onslaught on our identity, our sexual identity. And people are being robbed of that. I'm telling you, there is a spirit behind it. And we have to do our homework in the spirit realm. We can't just try to lobby the parliament. But I, I'm not saying that's not good, but we better do our homework before we start any lobbying in the natural. We better lobby in the spirit first. Deal with that thing. Dis Lord, cleanse me of every inward toleration of that spirit. Deliver Ask God to deliver you of every inward toleration because the church allowed it. They tolerated it. God cleanse me. And then as God cleanses you, you can then become a voice to bring freedom to others. You cannot bind what binds you. Just like you can't have authority over an enemy you're sleeping with. Jehu did not kill Jezebel. The eunuchs did. The people who had been oppressed by the spirit of Jezebel and have been paralyzed by her and have served her agenda for many, many years, all of a sudden, Jehu shows up and anointing comes on them and they throw her down. I believe it's a prophetic picture that God is saying to this generation. The reason why we're under so much, so much sexual onslaught and so much perversion, gender dysmorphia, and all this stuff around us is because we have an assignment to throw Jezebel down. So Jezebel and that spirit of the Antichrist is so furious in that generation because he wants to get us before we get it. 
it's, it's, it's almost striking first because it knows God has anointed you to deal with that spirit. I cannot stand on this platform and speak this message if I'm not dealing with that spirit in my life. I've got no authority to communicate this to you if I've not dealt with it in me, around me. But you are called to deal with it in a generation. That is why he wants to bind you first before you bind him. I'm telling you, this is a big deal. I know my time is gone, but I'm going to take my time. <laughs> I went to London to preach. I was invited by church. And uh, the first night was powerful. I was speaking all these words. I didn't realize it, but my preach, some of the words I was saying in terms of the exact words and sentences was things that happened with the pastors. They were, some of them were arguing amongst each other about doctrine and things. I didn't know about that. So I'm preaching, but like cutting through all that stuff and releasing words that was almost just, it doesn't make any sense, aligning things in the church. I didn't really, one of the pastors told me this. I was like, oh, wow, well, I had no idea. That's how God works, really. You just speak and he, he speaks through you and crazy things happen. So I was excited about that. I went to my hotel room to sleep. Um, that night, I had a dream. In my dream, I am in the hotel room. This is not a dream. This, I believe, actually was something that was going on in the spirit realm. And I was just awakened to that reality. So, I go to sleep, but in my dream, I am in the room. However, someone comes into the room. And do you know what came into the room? The best way to describe it is what I've just read in Revelations. Jezebel comes into the room. No clothes on. Jezebel comes into the room. However, she's talking to me in the dream. The Bible. I've not got my Bible here. I've got an iPad. So <laughs> I was going to say the Bible, but that's not the Bible. <laughs> she was sharing with me things from the Bible. Like, so everything that I was hearing was sounding good, but I am thinking to myself in the dream, this is not normal. This is not okay. I mean, this is not a usual situation. <laughs> and I'm thinking, can you not see that this is not okay? But she was acting like everything was just normal. So she's just sharing the word. So after a few moments, I get agitated. And I say to her in the dream, you need to leave now. Guess what? She didn't leave. <laughs> I was like, you must leave now. She wouldn't leave. In the dream, I said, I take authority over you. You need to leave right now. You know what happened? She started to shake and then ran out of the room. As she's running out of the room, I run after her. And I said, and I release the fire of God against you. You know what happened? She disintegrated and I woke up. <laughs> now, how many realize I woke up a happy man? <laughs> the first dream I had, I was struggling to deal with it. The next dream I had, I'm running after it and releasing the judgment of God against it. I'm telling you, the answer to a generation that's bound by perversion is fire. Do you understand with me? I believe God wanted us to highlight this today because he wants to set people free. Now, I want you to hear my heart in this. I am in no way wanting to push shame on anyone. I am in no way wanting you to feel like you're a horrible person, you know, you're struggling with pornography, you know, how dare you, you're so horrible, come forward, come forward, and everyone's going to go, oh, you're, there, so you're struggling. I've been there, so <laughs> I'm talking from a person that knows what it is to be addicted and bound, but... You know, I told you I was accountable to my dad. After that season, God broke that thing off of my life, and I've not been back there since. If he broke it off me, he can break it off you. And the altar call we're going to have right now is not just about people struggling with addictions. Because I don't want it to be just about that. I want to call you, if you're in this place and you're feeling a stirring in your heart, to step up in your purity. 
that God would give you eyes that burn like fire and you begin to just, a new, maybe your standard has been too low. You've been accepting things you should not be accepting in your house, in your the things you're watching, the movies you're going to, the music you're listening to. And just like, God, my level of consecration has to step up today. If that is you, I'm also calling you to respond to this article, as well as you who are feeling bound by the spirit of immorality. Another group I would like to answer this article. By the way, if you can turn the lights down, that would be awesome. I don't want you to become conscious about the people around you. Thank you guys at the back. Just have the house lights down. Yeah. Um, another group I want to respond to this are people who are struggling with shame and certain issues because of not what you've done, but what has been done to you by other people. I mean, it doesn't take the Holy Spirit to know that there are people in here that have been abused. And many times you can be infected, impacted, manipulated by spiritual things because of what someone in authority or someone you trusted has done to you. And when that happens, you need some ministry. As in, I mean, in the natural, people go for counseling, but I'm telling you, you need, because sex and all that stuff, it's not just a physical thing, it's a spiritual activity. Something needs to happen. Now, I know that's going to take courage. And I'm putting all these groups together so that you don't feel um, singled out and everyone's also like, oh, you're the one, you know, because I want you all to respond. So if you're struggling with addictions, if you're feeling like there's a need to step up your purity, or if you feel like you've been violated in some way and it's had a real impact on your whole life, maybe you've even become addicted to pornography because of that, or you've become, you know, same-sex attractions, things going on because of things that have happened to you, and you want God to deal with that today, trust me, I know this is sensitive what I'm talking about I am not taking this lightly at all and I want you to feel as confident as possible to come forward knowing that you're not being judged we have some ministry team here we want to pray deliverance over you today we want to pray the breaking in of God over you and I want to say this before we call people forward if you're not on our ministry team I know you may have a youth member or someone that may come forward please don't go and pray for them I just really would like our ministry team and some of the pastors that we've invited to minister to the people that come forward. Is that okay? Is that okay? I know this is really sensitive, but I'm telling you, for the prayer movement and the revival that God wants to release in the nation to be unleashed, the people of God needs to break free from the sexual perversion that has bound them and is paralyzing their effectiveness. I don't want you to be afraid. I am not going to judge you. I want to see freedom in this place because God set me free. I have been where many of you are. As the band plays softly in the background, I'm just going to pray. Father, I thank you for a deliverance anointing here today. I thank you that you're here to break every chain. There's no chain that intimidates you. Nothing intimidates you. I think that you see the pain, you see the struggles, you see all that. And you're angry at the injustice and the addictions that has bound your people. Father, I'm asking that there'll be a release of the anointing right now. Anyone in this room that's afraid to come forward, Lord, let all fear be broken. And let there be such a grace. So right now, I just want to invite you to come forward. You might, I want to encourage you to just get on your knees, if you don't mind, as a sign of just saying, God, I'm coming before you and saying, Lord, I'm surrendering to you. Come and release your deliverance. Thank you for responding. Keep praying. Don't stop. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, oh, there is freedom. There is freedom. There is freedom. Yes. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, yes.
in 